All right, the time has arrived. It is 9 a.m. We'll call to order the Leap Day 2024 meeting of the Golden Rain Foundation Board. Roll call, Deborah. Certainly, Walker. Here. Hamaji. Here. Topper. Yes, here. Hurt. Hurt. Yes, here. Bentley. Here. Hines. Here. Lee. Here. Lair. Here. Meehan. Here. And Matheson. Here. Okay, thank you. The minutes from the January 25th meeting are in the agenda packet. Are there any comments or revisions? Seeing none, they are approved as submitted. Thank you, Deborah. A brief announcement uh, just for interested parties. There is nothing on the agenda today regarding the um, land use study that was uh, being considered by planning and finance last month. Uh, it will be coming up in the future, but it has been referred back by the board to the planning committee as well as the finance committee uh, to um, update the facilities master plan and, um, um, and and also take a look at the funding requirements into the future. So uh, nothing on the agenda today. Uh, so update from the city of Walnut Creek. We are always pleased to have a council member from the city attend our board meetings. And Cindy Darling, welcome back. Thank you. Kevin Wilk is off on vacation. And since I am also a frequent vacationer, I'm always more than happy to step in for him. Um, so it's been an active couple weeks around the city. A lot of people have heard or read in the news about our city council meeting. We had previously had um, anti-Semitic neo-Nazi, and I think we're gonna stop calling them neo-Nazi because they're just flat Nazis, um, coming on the Zoom portion of the meeting. We cut off Zoom and kind of thought, well, you know, it's a long way from Modesto to Walnut Creek. Well, lo and behold, last Tuesday night, we did get uh, an in-person visitor from our little Nazi friend. Um, he came up with his two minutes of vitriol and, you know, just, and it, it kind of surprised us all that he came in person. Uh, a couple things I wanted to note. One is um, he is fundraising off of the outrage. He has a blog that he puts little clips of people reacting to him, which is why in real time we're not reacting to him. We're just giving him that. Um, we do, you know, step in after he's done and, you know, indicate that this is not who we are as a city. I apologize to Kevin for the targeting that Kevin is getting out of this deal. Um, but we're kind of trying to treat him like a school shooter. You don't want to give him notoriety because he fundraises off us. But we are looking at our procedures, the city attorney, the chief of police, and the city manager. are re-looking at our, our um, scripts that we use in the meeting to be more clear about vulgar language and um, you know um, fighting words and things that we can control. So we're hoping that... It's one and done, but hope has sprung in the past and not actually come to fruition. So we are going to continue to not let him get to us and um, just assume that he is an unhappy, bitter little man. Cindy, could I interrupt? Sure, go ahead. Uh, just please pass along our rejection of those disturbing words and, and know that we support <coughs> you as well as Kevin Wilkes. This is very disturbing. Uh, using such hate language in, in that manner. So please know that we support you guys. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And Kevin was getting the support real time. I don't know if you saw. Cindy Silva was holding his hand. But, you know, we wove into our public comments about our activities. And Kevin got members of the community far and wide reaching out to him. And he that really is an important part of the process of kind of not letting this get to, especially Kevin, since he is so targeted. Um, and I appreciate that. Thank you. So upcoming council meetings. So March is going to be all about our community center and pool. Um, we looked at the buildings themselves last time and gave direction to the, uh, we're at the um, schematic design phase. And so it's starting to look real. So the next council meeting, we were, are going to look at the pool and how the pools are configured and how they balance between competitive swimming, recreational swimming, and all the other things that are in demand. And then the meeting after that, we're gonna look at sustainability of the structure. And one of the things that we're gonna look at is whether or not we upgrade the buildings so that they are an essential services hub 
and there's a set of standards that go up with a building that allow it to withstand um, an emergency, an earthquake or something like that, so that um, whatever function goes on there can continue. Right now, City Hall is a fairly robust place, but it doesn't meet the emergency services hub. So we're gonna be looking at whether or not we build this structure to meet those standards. Um, and then in April, we're gonna go back to, speaking of safety, we're gonna go back to our uh, buffer zone uh, around Planned Parenthood. Uh, when we visited that the first time and came up with the buffer zone that balances the First Amendment rights of the protesters and the rights of the patients and staff to um, access healthcare quietly, uh, we didn't address the um, amplified sound. And now we have a um, ordinance that was passed in Sacramento that appears to meet the needs. So that should be coming to us in April to look at a couple goings on about town. Um, many of you saw that uh, Macy's has announced that the Union Square Macy's is closing. We have heard nothing in the city about Macy's from either Broadway Plaza or from Macy's itself. Um, and all indications are is that the retail at Broadway Plaza is doing very, very well. Um, San Francisco's losses are gain. Um, so we don't expect, we are not at this time expecting anything to change at Macy's. Um, the other thing, there's a, the fountain downtown in front of um, Mechanics Bank, the one that my kids call the freaky golden baby head, which is actually called Fountainhead. Um, it is going to go um, get taken out for some restoration. It's been um, there for 10 years, and it, he's got some bubbles on his head now. Um, so don't be surprised, and don't think that we don't love the freaky golden baby head, because we do love that piece of art. Um, Insurance-wise, um, we have heard from a number of different homeowners associations that they're under the same kind of pressure that you guys are, so we included in our legislative priorities this year the ability for us as a council to comment on um, changes in insurance that are affecting our community. So we've heard what you guys are saying, given ourselves that ability, and we'll kind of be tracking that as we go forward with the legislative year. Uh, we also appointed a whole new slew of um, commissioners. We had people on our that represent the city on council and aging. We have the mosquito and vector control person now. Um, a bunch of great um, people, including Molly Klopp, who is a Rossmore resident, who is now on our planning commission. If you have any opinions about downtown, you can go visit with Molly. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to close on a happy note, because I started with our little Nazi friend, and that's not a happy thing. But at a recent um, event at the Lesher Theater, we had a medical emergency in the audience, and our staff has a whole emergency protocol. They kicked in, put the protocol in place, got a couple audience members with medical training to step in and began the CPR process. Um, they asked the audience to remain in their seats until the matter was resolved and the audience members were golden about that. The paramedics got there, the patient got to John Muir Health in record time and we got a really nice thank you note from the individual who had suffered the attack. And it, it was a very, it was an ABBA tribute band thing. And so there was a million ABBA puns in the thank you letter from this gentleman. <laughs> but the best part of it was he said that he and his wife are married for 64 years. And he just thanked everybody involved for giving them the chance to go to 65. So that was a, that was a really nice, you know, it makes me feel good. Everybody in our city pulled together and helped this individual get the help they needed. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Maxine? First of all, thank you for all you do, and thank you for your clear explanations of what's going on in the city. I just, I love all that, and I love the story about the man going to 65. Um, I do have a question, and thank you for your words about that man. I, yeah. what, um, made me very uncomfortable to see the video. Um, personally, professionally, all over the place, yes. humanly. From a policy perspective, it looked like he was holding a, ca a phone to take pictures. Why was that allowed? Um, I'll have to ask the city manager. I, I know we have, we don't, I know you guys have um, filming prohibited in here, or don't, do you? I don't know if you do. I, I don't believe we specifically say, uh, in the normal script we say, this is a business meeting, no profanity, um, but we haven't said anything about 
photography. And we do have one gentleman that's a frequent flyer at city council who does regularly videotape us. He's a homeless fellow who has mental challenges and he likes to do that. So we haven't made an issue with him, but I will bring it up with the city manager why we allow that. Because the fellow is fundraising off of us. Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments? <clears throat> Ted? So you mentioned about the insurance. Mm -hmm. That is a really big thing for everybody and becoming a big thing here too. Um, where are we at? Where's the city at with that as far as, as what's, your, what's your future look as to what we can do to maybe curb some of it or help out the situation? Yeah, we asked when we were looking at our legislative priorities, we have a contract with Townsend um, to do lobbying in Sacramento. And we asked them about what's going on. Um, and he, so our lobbyist is going to, to track what the um, insurance commissioner and others are doing. There's apparently a lot of conversation, but they haven't seen a concrete um, plan come out in Sacramento yet. So we'll, we're kind of in that point where it's not an issue we're going to be able to drive. We're a city. It's not. But we're going to be able to lend support when a solution starts to come together. So that's kind of where we are. And just <clears throat> one more. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we have a residence form here also, and mm -hmm. it is a residence form. So it's a, we really want to hear from all of our residents. Is Walnut Creek open there? Form is that open for anybody from anywhere in California to come to and, and do it? That's what I was I was totally misunderstood. I couldn't understand why this person came from someplace else to Walnut Creek to do his show. So I just wonder, is there some or some way that you handle that, or or is it open for everybody? It it is an open forum, and we have um, gotten advice from our attorney. The, apparently, the court cases say. Um, they, they do provide some direction that we can't insist that people give us their full name and their full address. So it, you know, it, it's, it's a balance because the First Amendment, it's part of the Bill of Rights. It's super important. But on the other hand, with both what happens at Planned Parenthood and what happens at the City Council is it allows people that have truly abhorrent views or very, you know, are willing to create uncomfortable situations, it gives them power. Um, so we're balancing. We're, we're going through and re-looking at everything now that we understand that just getting off of Zoom wasn't enough to prevent this from happening again. So we'll look at what we can do as far as limiting. Um, and I think also one of the things I would like to see is um, they're watching the audience's reaction. We all knew what was going to happen because we knew who this person was. Um, the audience didn't, and we need to help them understand that, okay, you're going to hear something now that is going to be very uncomfortable, and here's why we are letting them, you know, it is the First Amendment, it is his right, but you don't have to stay here. The audience member doesn't need to stay there. They can get up and leave. They don't have to listen to it. You can mute your TV and come back after you've got your bowl of ice cream two minutes. Thank you. Leanne? You may not know the answer to this, but I assume that your legal perspective on open forum is different because you're a public entity? Yeah, we, we operate, our um, attorney goes through all the case law from the different cities, and I think a city is diff intrinsically different than what you guys are, it operates under a different set of rules. So... So, Cindy, back to the insurance for just a second. And I realize that maybe the city feels like there's not a whole lot you can do, but hearing that your lobbyist knows that it's a priority for Walnut Creek residents and especially for Rossmore is important as we try to build support with yeah. all of our elected representatives, uh, the state senator and the state assembly person and, and congressman and, and so on. So we really appreciate yeah. you taking that to that legislative committee and making that a priority. Thank well, you. And, and one of the other things that happened is we heard from a number of other HOAs. Um, I think the keys is having the same problem. This is, this, you are not alone in this challenge. We, we realize that. It doesn't make <laughs> yeah. it feel any better, but yeah. No, it doesn't make anyone feel, <laughs> if it makes you feel better, I had to ask my insurance agent, it's like, well, why didn't I get my liability renewal? And he goes, oh, didn't I tell you? 
Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's everybody. Hey, one more thing. Sunny, we, we, we continually hear complaints from residents as well as from staff members here about the length of time that it takes for permits to be approved through the city. Is there any initiative to speed that process up or make it more efficient? Yeah, we, um, one of our five priorities is economic development and a subset of that economic development um, priority is um, working on the permitting process. And so um, based on the last update we got, they are trying to make it so that you can apply more easily online. That we are trying to help the individual city departments, because there are different city departments, there's planning, there's engineering, and um, permitting, we're helping them work better as a team, and we're looking at a couple other ways to make permitting easier. We recognize how difficult it can be. Um, I, It is something I get calls from regularly from people, friends and neighbors saying, hey. So we recognize that it's a problem, and we're working on it. It's um, it's a whole combination of things that need to happen. Yeah, because we don't really want to refer all the complaints we get about the Tice Valley pool roof yeah. <laughs> that's being held up <laughs> by the city of Walnut Creek. So whatever you can do would be greatly appreciated. We will work. <laughs> we will make sure that everything happens as quickly as it can. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. And anyway, Ted. Uh, just one more question. Uh, we didn't talk, uh, or you didn't mention anything about our police situation, uh, mm-hmm. where we at with staffing and stuff. Around Rossmore, we have the speed meters, and right underneath the speed meters, it says patrolled by Walnut Creek Police, or, or to something to that effect. But we don't see much of that going on. And on the, sp- the speed readers, I think that people try to they're using it either to check their speedometer to see how high it'll go or <laughs> because at a certain point it says we cannot even record your car anymore please slow down you know the sign yeah. changes and and it uh, becomes your mother and starts yeah, scolding just, you. i would like it if the sign would say slow down ted you yeah. know it would be great if it could identify me and say that not that i do that i'm just saying it would be interesting yeah. if we could do that but um Anyway, I'm, 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 I'm not trying to make a joke about it. It is serious. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, when I walk around, I see cars uh, on, the, on Golden Rain. Uh, that one doesn't have a slowdown one. It marks the speed, and it's, many times cars are doing well over 40 miles an hour going down that street. And I was just wondering, when are we going to see some presence here and them taking care of that situation. Yeah, I will pass it along to, to Chief Knox. Um, we are actively working to make sure that we get our police staffing up, and then he is prioritizing you know, different areas as things happen. Um, I know downtown was a huge priority during Christmas. Um, I had to tell the chief one time I went downtown, I think I saw four, four separate police vehicles in about 20 minutes. So that was where they all were in December. Um, but I will pass it on to the chief. I think the other thing that we are looking at as a city is the um, pedestrian safety and how to help control speed in neighborhoods. And we're looking at a number of different things. We're in what the traffic engineers call the plastic phase right now. Because if you narrow uh, the perception of a road, it will make people slow down. And so there's some places in our neighborhoods where we now have, especially around sidewalks, where we have plastic pylons that narrow the road and it it creates a mental, like, oh, I should pay attention um, because we're all herd animals and we just think of that. Um, So that's one of the other things that we can look at is, you know, I know some of your roads around here are those classic really wide boulevards that we all built thinking that was really a fun thing to build back in the 70s and makes people go really fast so there's there's a there's two different ways to approach it and we'll keep our eye on it i'll talk to the chief about patrol all right cindy thank you very much all right thank you guys keep up the good work thanks Next up, we have financial reports. Uh, Mary Hurt, Treasurer, and Amanda Davis, uh, Controller. Thank you, Mr. President. At the end of uh, January, revenue is over budget by $94,000. Year-to-date January 
this, this favorable balance is due for increases in golf, media, recreation, and other revenue. Personal training in the other revenue category was the main reason for the favorable results. It was 112,000, excuse me, 12,000 over budget. As well, expenses are under budget by 195,000 due to favorable expense variances in wages, professional services and supplies, utilities, respectively. Oops. There's a net positive variance, va excuse me, there's a net positive budget variance at the end of January, revenue less expenses of 289,000 for year to date January. And now Amanda, can you give us greater details? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Let's see if I can get this to advance. <laughs> oh, back, too far. Okay, so thank you, Mary. So going into the MOG division of the operation, revenue was under budget by 207,000 or 20% year to date for January. Um, this is due to really um, the building maintenance um, due to the staffing level with the carpenters as well as the rainy season is, is challenging to get out there and do exterior work. Um, so the shortfall in the building maintenance was 123000 and then also the fees associated with the home sales for the month are down, those processing fees that we collect. Um, and then in addition to that, our landscape and miscellaneous income was also down 33000 um, Total expenses were also under budget by 54000 Other professional services, uh, 55000 um, is projected to be recorded in February for the GenArc replacement project. And then, so year-to-date expenses for MOG, um, one million exceeded year-to-date revenues of 830,000 for a deficit of 205 year-to-date in January. So the net deficit to budget for MOT was 153,000 year to date. For the trust fund activity, the membership transfer fees, as I mentioned, were 234,000. Um, this is um, compared to year over year, um, an increase of 34,000. Um, however, January seems to be a very slow month for sales. So the total fund additions for year-to-date in January were 657000 and then the expenditures, which would be um, capital expenses and the capital machinery and equipment, were 361000 making the surplus for the trust fund of 295000 I keep pushing the wrong button. <laughs> there we go. So total cash overall is at $15.6 at the end of January which is comprised of 4.8 um, in the GRF, 10.1 million in the trust fund, and 670,000 in the MOD. At the end of January, the bank loan balances totaled 9.6 million, and the pension liability at 4.2. And the graphs are portraying these things. And any, any questions, questions for Amanda? Yeah. So, Amanda, the MOD results look negative, and they are, <laughs> but, but that's not unusual, as I recall. January normally runs with that sort of uh, anticipation, and, and that's anticipated in the budget for the Def year. Definitely. Um, the budget is spread out evenly over 12 months rather than any seasonalization. Um, we hope to, you know, we're putting a lot on our net suite, <laughs> but we're hoping to be able to do more seasonalization once we have a, a better a better tool to do those things with. But um, for now, we're doing, you know, splitting it evenly over the 12 months, and then January is historically compared to budget under budget. Any other questions for Amanda? 
Uh, just one note, and I think we're going to talk about it later. Interest earned on GRF op operations uh, for 2023, as well as in January, is low. And I think uh, that Tom is going to address that later in the meeting, I believe. Correct. So okay. we've been looking at um, what interest we're earning, what opportunities are out there. And then Tom will have some presentation later in the meeting. Great. All right. Anything else? If not, thank you, Amanda. Of thank course. you, Mary. All right. Next up, uh, Jeff, the GM report. Good morning, everybody. We are almost to March already. This time, time in 2024 is, is certainly flying by. Uh, for this uh, month's report, I wanted to highlight the excursion desk. And I know that many of you and, and others have taken advantage of the day outings as well as potentially some of the longer excursions that are available. But this is a department that certainly has come back to life over the last uh, year uh, coming out of the pandemic. And there are a number of really exciting upcoming day trips as well as uh, long uh, excursions that I think I may need to chaperone on uh, the, the Alaskan Inside Passage and, and so forth. There is a, a list. If you need more information, please stop by the, the Recreation Department on those. But take advantage of that department uh, and book a, a fun outing. There are certainly a lot of questions and concerns about a number of topics that uh, are going on throughout Rossmore right now. So I thought I'd put in a, a section and call it just, just the facts and try and give you and, and the, the residents some information on a few items that I've heard come up uh, mentioned at, at meetings or in the paper or just around. The first one is, uh, is GRF or Rossmore financially secure? This, uh, this topic has come up uh, basically surrounding two items, the first being the uh, in property insurance coverage. As we've talked about almost on a, a monthly basis, uh, our insurance rates and was just discussed here have skyrocketed over the, the last couple of years. And with the current year, rates are up over 50%, while our total coverage based on our insured value is about at 40% of our total total uh, insured value. This has left Rossmore in the position, the uncomfortable position that we've discussed of being unwarrantable by Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac. And the question is, why don't we just buy more, more coverage? Can we get to that? Well, at, at 1.16 billion to get to the 2.66 billion, we'd have to almost double our coverage. Uh, the premiums this, this last year were close to 22 million. To add the additional coverage would be another approximately 20 million. And $40 million for insurance coverage uh, for this community is, is just not feasible. We are financially sound, the mutuals are sound, GRF is sound, but 40 million for, for coverage, that's assuming that it's even available, it just is, is too far. The other uh, area where this question arose is, was why is GRF even talking about uh, a land use study uh, surrounding the uh, parcel where the Garden Club is and the parcel uh, at the corner of Terra Granada Drive and, and Great Eagle. Why are we looking at it? It seems desperate to sell a, a parcel. Uh, are we in poor financial condition? And the answer to that is, is that really was a fact-finding mission. We, uh, the board adopted a facilities master plan in two, 2022. That plan identifies a number of projects that need to be considered over the next 10 years and beyond. We have an aging infrastructure with Hillside Clubhouse being a, a 1960s build. Uh, Stanley Dollar Clubhouse is a 1930s build. Uh, we have the need to uh, uh, replace the MOD complex. That was the number one priority identified. All of these projects, along with just the normal upkeep, is beyond what can be funded by the traditional membership transfer fee, which is what goes to pay for our capital projects. So we need to uh, evaluate that, consider a number of options. Do we in increase the membership transfer fee? Do we look to further loans, lending opportunities? Do we look for opportunities such as the uh, 
the land use study would, would provide us. And again, it's to provide us information so we can evaluate best all of those options. It is not an indication of any financial concerns. That topic, uh, as, as the president uh, just talked about, will be further discussed in context of the facilities master plan in the coming months. Another question, will my manor be covered in the event of a catastrophe because of the insurance crisis? Uh, as we have talked, the insurance coverage is about 40% of our total insured value, but that does not mean in the case of a catastrophe, you won't have 100% coverage. The way our policy works is it is, provides 100% replacement value, walls in coverage in the event of a loss up to our insurance uh, coverage maximum of 1.16 billion. That is pretty much targeted with a one in 10,000 year loss event. So we have significant coverage that will provide 100% replacement value up to that insurance limit. It would take a major, major catastrophe for us not to have 100% replacement value. The next question, can I get a reverse mortgage for my manor? Many residents use reverse mortgages for a, a number of things. And the concern now is that that may be, be hindered by our uh, being classified as unwarrantable by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Certainly there is an, an impact. Many lenders are working through this. The realty market is working through this. If you are interested in a reverse mortgage, please do continue to talk to your financial advisors, your lending institutions. There may be options out there, but it is something that is an ongoing crisis that uh, we just heard from the, the city. We are working on it. Uh, there was an article in the paper yesterday about it. Encourage you to make your voices heard on that issue. It will take some legislative action to uh, start to get some, some momentum. Another question, is GRF controlling free speech by amending the demonstration policy? Uh, many of you know that the planning committee, or excuse me, the policy committee has been discussing the demonstration policy over the last few months and will continue to do so. Again, as we just heard from the, the city, there, that was a perfect example of why uh, this topic is even before the policy committee. As a private community, Rossmore does have the ability to set boundaries on what is considered uh, acceptable demonstrations, what is acceptable to be published in the paper, what is acceptable to be placed on uh, GRF property walls. Mutuals are all independent. They need to set their own policies. But this is your home. This is where you uh, come every day. It is different than public property. It is different than a public city council meeting. Uh, we do have some ability to consider what is uh, acceptable. So that, that uh, discussion will be ongoing. It is certainly a delicate topic and one that the, the policy committee is taking careful consideration as they debate that. When will the pool roof at Tice Creek Fitness Center be fixed? This is actually a project that was funded back in 2022, and I do share your frustration over why this hasn't been completed yet. Uh, first, we got caught up in a supply chain issue. The, this project involves replacing uh, about 40 motors that control all of the, the roof structure. Uh, it is a retractable roof in several places. It is also a project that replaces all of the panels. This type of building requires that every so many years. Uh, that was constructed originally, I believe, in 2007. So it is kind of past that time frame. Once we receive the, the motors, uh, about a year after the order was placed, uh, the panels were delivered. They are on site, ready to go. We got caught up in a, uh, a debate over the permit. We thought this would be a pretty simple roof replacement over the counter permit. It just turned out not to be such. So we are working with the city to get that resolved and hopefully that will be scheduled in the near future. We are mindful of the timing of scheduling. We wanna keep the facility open as much as possible. So we will be announcing that, that work in the coming months. Uh, when will the heater be replaced at uh, Tice Creek for the lap pool there? 
This is, a, again, a, a project that is taking longer than we certainly would like, and we know that you certainly would, would like to see it happen. Pool parts and pool uh, components are one of the things that are probably the most frustrating to maintain and uh, replace. This pool heater that went down is a, a high efficiency unit. It is within its expected useful life still, but it is beyond its warranty. Our uh, initial effort was to have it inspected, have it uh, repaired, and, and go about our way. Unfortunately, after the diagnostic, it was determined that the heater, the repairs would cost more than the replacement, so the decision was made to replace it. These heaters actually come from, I believe it's Tennessee. It takes four to six weeks to get it trucked here, uh, so we are a little bit at the mercy of the, the timing of that. We anticipate it will be back in service sometime uh, around mid to end of March. Another one that's an interesting one that has come up quite frequently and one that I've heard from actually our drivers being discussed uh, on the bus system, and that is, is the bus system going away? Are we, are we ending the bus service? And certainly the bus system is one that has been impacted probably the most coming out of the pandemic in terms of the delivery service, in terms of staffing levels, and in terms of people being ready to use the system and comfortable using the system. I can assure you that the uh, bus service is a vital service. It is fully funded in the 2024 operating budget. We are going to be doing a uh, service level study on the, the, the bus system with the effort to maximize the service based on our, our current budget budgeted resources. And that should be something uh, rolling out probably this summer, but the bus system is not going away. Why are so many employees leaving? We have, uh, we've had quite a turnover rates this last few months in a few key areas uh, of resident services, whether that is recreation, where we had uh, vacancies with the rec manager, the, uh, senior, uh, the senior position for community services. We've now had some turnover with the fitness center, with fitness staff, and the management positions there, and some other key uh, components. And that certainly impacts our ability to deliver services. Coming out of the pandemic, we, we had a significant uh, turnover uh, concern where we had up to about 24 vacancies at one point. Today, we're at around six. So things have improved. We do uh, have a, a new uh, director or senior uh, director of resident services that I'm gonna introduce here shortly. We do have uh, an offer out and expect a new recreation manager very soon. We are just starting to advertise for a new uh, a fitness and aquatics manager and supervisor. We're recruiting for fitness trainers. So things are looking up, but we're just in a different, a different area coming out of the pandemic in terms of how the uh, employee base uh, and of the market is responding. How come I can't reserve a room through uh, the recreation department? This is one that impacts uh, clubs, mutuals, residents, and other organizations. So the clubhouse rooms and amenities are certainly for the enjoyment of Rossmore clubs, organizations, mutuals, and residents. We're striving to make these rooms available to meet the needs of, of all of those groups. There's several factors certainly that are Im impeding that uh, process right now. One, as I just mentioned, we had two key vacancies in that department. But the other is there's been significant turnover also at the club leadership level. History and how that gets passed on from club president to club president during reservation times has caused some, some challenges. Usually our staff is able to work with them, contact them, remind them, say, hey, you've got to come do your, your annual bookings. That hasn't happened. So we are definitely behind in the process of completing annual bookings to make sure that all clubs are taken care of. In order to do that, we've put a pause on additional new reservations. We are completing that process here in the near uh, future, and then we'll be able to start taking reservations again. 
This whole process, though, has highlighted some issues that certainly Anne has been evaluating. Uh, we are looking at improvements to our reservation software, and we certainly will uh, be talking to the, the board and the policy committee about some of the policies around uh, reservations in the near future. So the future, again, I think looks bright for that uh, department and that process. It will take some, some effort to get there through that as I mentioned, we do have a uh, new employee, and I'd like to introduce Kelsey Klima. I believe she's here. Kelsey, why don't you come on down? Kelsey comes to us. Uh, she is our new, uh, what, what is your title anyway? I keep butchering it. Senior Manager of Resident Senior Services. Senior Manager of Resident <laughs> Services, thank you. Uh, which oversees a number of the community services departments, including uh, bus transportation, recreation, uh, custodial, fitness, and aquatics, and works directly under Ann Matola. Uh, Kelsey comes to us with experience from uh, a city background. She did work with Anne in San Bruno, but uh, most recently comes to us from the city of Vacaville and has extensive uh, experience, especially in reservations, which we just talked about, which we, we look forward to tapping her expertise in. But you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah. My name is Kelsey Klima. Uh, yeah, I've been in recreation for 15 years, um, most recently with Vacaville and with the city of San Bruno and a couple other cities. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I've been here about two weeks now and I'm really enjoying myself and I'm excited to bring what I know to the staff as well as really learn from them coming from a different area of recreation. And I'm really excited. I'm having a lot of fun so far. Thanks, Kelsey. Welcome, Thank Kelsey. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> are there any questions that, that uh, Jeff did not answer? <laughs> I'm sure there are more. Let's move on to Residence Forum. Uh, Maxine Topper and Deborah. Go ahead, Deborah. Residents have up to two minutes to address the board. The board does not directly answer questions posed by speakers during the Residence Forum, but it does hear the viewpoints and ideas presented, and members do consider them as they act during the meeting. Speakers must conduct themselves with proper decorum consistent with community standards that would not be offensive to a reasonable person, as determined at the sole discretion of the GRF board. Participants may not engage in personal attacks, threats of any kind, or any other disruptive behavior. Speakers violating these rules may be expelled from the meeting and precluded from speaking at future meetings, as determined by the board. In-person forum instructions. Complete the residence forum slip and then give your slip to the board secretary. Copies of handouts or notes should also be given to the board secretary. Zoom forum instructions. If you wish to address the board, use the raise hand feature or press star nine if connecting via phone audio only. Residents are welcome to type their comment in the Q&A chat feature located on the control panel of Zoom at the start of the meeting and up until the start of the residence forum. Please wait your turn and once unmuted, state your full name and Rossmore address. Once the residence forum has begun, additional resident comments will not be considered. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Our first speaker is Barbara Whiteman. Good morning and thank you. My name is Barbara Whiteman and I am the president of the- Your name, your address. 1601 Please. Oakmont Drive, number one. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm the president of the Garden Club. I'm here again to register the Garden Club's opposition to GRF's plan to potentially sell off its valuable asset. You as a board are here to act in our best interests and I'm not sure how that lines up with erasing the years of hard work and investment of Rossmore residents. I really don't think it does. And you as a board have the power to stop all ideas about putting the garden property on the auction block. Why have you not already done this? And you as a board must know that in spite of Jeff Matheson's words of reassurance that members will have a new garden, you can't replace what has taken years to create. 
And yes, we know that the way real estate deals work, a condition of sale might be that the developer or the purchaser be responsible for moving us, saving GRF the expense and the headache. But tell me this, tell all of us this, how are they going to move or replace Bruce's 15-year-old peach tree or Vicky's 10-year-old persimmon tree or any of the other 119 mature fruit trees that are just now beginning to bud out? You can't because it's not feasible. Those irreplaceable trees will be cut down and hauled away, you have 30 seconds. leaving nothing but scars. You must know your decision to go forward with this land use study is creating great distress. You know you can relieve that stress by stopping the study before it has begun and before the $20,000 has been spent. Please, I am asking on behalf of 217 Garden Club members for you to make the right decision. Not to just table the decision, but to reverse it. Thank you. Next speaker is Melanie Rose. Please state your name and Rosmore address. Thank you. Uh, Melanie Rose, 2000 Pine Knoll, Unit 4. I got some great advice the other day that I should read the 10-year plan and facilities study to better understand where the board is coming from when it comes in regards to selling land. I read the studies, and a few things stuck out to me. The initial 10-year plan was done 15 years ago. The facilities study, three years ago. The facilities study made only a modest attempt at resident input, survey, and focus groups. Only 5% of an almost 10,000 person population responded to the survey, even less in the focus groups. Focus groups were sectioned into topic groups, meaning the focus group discussing, discussing building new offices for MOD consisted of MOD. Residents were only surveyed on activities and amenities. No residents were asked to provide feedback on management performance or whether they desired to be governed so tightly by a property manager. The board also has to take responsibility and consider our current financial state. We cannot be taking out loans and selling land to support building new offices for MOD. And this is not to say that I'm not sympathetic to the building they are working in, as the building I live in and many residents here has also aged out, has no insulation, deep cracks in my ceiling with single window panes. We need to really consider whether these studies are an accurate representation of today's population. How are we going to meet the needs of residents yeah, not 10 seconds. years down the line, but 50? A way for us to think about this is, if Rossmore were traded on the New York Stock Exchange, would residents invest or sell? Thank you. Next speaker is Fran Gibson. Good morning, directors, fellow residents. I'm Fran Gibson, 4503 Terra Granada Drive, 3B. I am here to invite you to a birthday party. You will all receive a save the date, so don't worry about writing this down. It's April 11th on a Thursday from 4.30 to 6.30. Please come and help Rossmore Emergency Preparedness Organization celebrate its 32 years of hopefully making a difference in the well-being and safety of residents here. And on that note, I'd like to give a big shout out to Tom Cashon, our awesome public safety director, who sent me a copy of the 2018 Ready Form, R-E-D-I, which is for new residents on emergencies and disasters. And when I became president of EPO more than four years ago, I put that ready sheet up on my vision board. So I wanna to thank Tom for removing that because he gave me the opportunity on my birthday, I might add, to stop and to add some punch, some specific steps that residents have to take to ready their household for an emergency or a disaster that strikes them or Rossmore, or even more than Rossmore. So thank you, I think we have a good, improved, ready tip sheet, and I wanna thank Tom Cashon for my birthday present. Take good care, and I make these remarks in the memory 
of uh, yeah, Cindy Ware. Uh, we lost her, as you know, several weeks back, a wonderful resident here who did a great deal to help make Ross more sustainable. So thank you. Next speaker is Ann Foreman. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ann Foreman, 5333 Terra Granada 1A. And I'm going to change a little bit what I was going to say because I really appreciate, Jeff, your overview on finances because, of course, I live on Terra Granada and I'm terrified of the idea of building on that beautiful hillside there. But I've been thinking about the finances, and I so appreciate, Jeff, that you say GRF finances are in okay shape now. It's only the future that we need to worry about. And I'm thinking about this venue. It's, I've never liked this venue of the GRF board where we get up for two minutes, and we I feel like we're kind of blasting at you, and we don't get feedback, and then we sit out here, and you talk, and we don't get to talk back and forth. So I have a suggestion. Would you put on a town hall event at the event center that's just GRF finances for the future, what you need for the future, get all residents involved and have it back and forth, back and forth, so we get lots of questions and answers. Because I, you know, people are really yeah, upset right now. And I think we can head this off if we handle the venue in a different way and really get more information to everybody. Thank you. Next speaker is Linda Fletcher. <clears throat> Morning. This is like being on Jeopardy. Name and, name and oh. <laughs> this, sorry. <laughs> I'm speaking to that point. This is like being on Jeopardy. If you forget your name and address, it's like missing, you know, not saying what is or who is. Anyway. So, I'm at 5951 Autumn Wood, and my name is Linda Fletcher. The uh, yield study has been renamed to the land study. Uh, I, this feels kind of unnecessary, but building on unstable hills in earthquake country doesn't seem to be a good idea. We all remember the two houses that are gone that used to be on top of the hill at Eagle Ridge and the subsequent demolition of those two hills. Um, and you, everybody can, if they go to the east side of the golf course, they can see the mudslides throughout Ross Moore's east hills. The hill that is being considered now for building is right next to the, ha the, the hill on Eagle Ridge where the houses slid down. A single evacuation route uh, on a two-lane road is terrifying the residents. Other evacuation routes are closed and would need to be ordered open by civil authorities. Um, I assume Jeff has that Do you have number. Thirty seconds. Thank you. By his bedside. And building medium density housing here significantly heightens fire risk. Whatever financial decisions have been taken in the past, this is not the fix. You are all residents. This is our home. Please drop this disastrous, destructive idea for gardeners and residents. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the residence forum. Is there anybody on Zoom? Yes. Okay. So then we it have doesn't. One speaker. Come. 
I am unmuting handle name Mary Ann Clark. Can you please state your full name and Rossmore address? Mary Ann Clark, 1780 Stanley Dollar Drive. Um, I'm wondering if the following proposals are in the master plan. I am disturbed as are many residents about the proposal to disrupt, remove, and relocate the Rossmore Garden Club. This group has created a congenial community and the move to sell their land to a developer is abhorrent. The proposal to create a new mutual is another affront to residents. I moved here in 2009 and was assured by my real estate agent that Rossmore had been built out. Many residents have repeated this claim. Residents feel they have been lied to by real estate agents. Some speak of a class action lawsuit. We are on a slippery slope when the GRF board starts selling off our land and invites development because they need the money. Greedy real estate developers and architectural firms stand to receive a tidy sum to develop Rossmore. They are hired to perform a feasibility study which serves themselves, not Rossmore residents. We need to stop this practice and start relying on resident committees to study these issues. We have a stake more than anyone else in what happens here, and we have the expertise and experience to determine how our money should be spent. Stop the development. We can't afford it. If the GRF board thinks that selling off our land to, to developers and scratching the backs of architectural firms is wise, we need to look more closely at how they are managing our funds. For a start, maybe the pickleball court needs to be postponed until we can afford it. Maybe the water management idea needs to be taken off the table. Our coupons are going up and it seems like spending is out of control. Many residents feel there is reckless development in Rossmore. There is insufficient funding. And I feel the two minute limit is disrespectful to residents. Thank that you. That is time. That concludes the residence forum. Okay, thank you everybody. And now for resident advisory committees, finance committee, Adrian Byron. Good morning, everybody. Um, our meeting on uh, Tuesday was fairly short, fairly straightforward. There were not a great number of things uh, addressed there. Uh, one of the issues um, about the uh, shortfall in um, MOD revenues because of building maintenance, I believe you are going to be addressing that in your executive session, and um, I urge you to uh, do whatever it takes to get a more uh, carpenters on board. We have to solve that problem. Um, a motion was made and seconded to remove, recommend approval to the GRF board for the emergency expense not to exceed $35,000 with um, for replacing um, certain valves for the, the this area of uh, Rossmore, um, there was a question raised about whether that should be a capital expense or an operating expense, and I uh, I assume we will get that resolved. Um, and um, and then there were, there was considerable discussion around uh, the way we're investing our funds, the millions of dollars that are held in cash. Um, and I, I know uh, Tom has been doing considerable amount of work on that. And I think that work obviously needs to continue. Um, we don't have a, a recommendation at this point, however. Any questions? Any questions for Adrian? All right, thank you, Adrian. Okay, Appreciate thank it. you. And uh, next is a discussion of that investment of cash balances. And I believe Tom Hand is available. Yes, I am. Hi, Tom. I'm here. Hi, how are you all doing today? To answer the question on whether to uh, capitalize or immediately expense the valves, uh, the valve replacement on the uh, water mains, and following up with our CPA, uh, that's considered an operating expense because those valves don't extend the life of the infrastructure itself. It's more of a maintenance item, uh, one-time type expense. Uh, so we will be expensing that based upon the discussion I had with our CPA. Is there any questions on that? No, thanks for doing that, Tom. Okay, great. 
Uh, Gerald, if you could bring up the uh, the slide, the uh, bank matrix. There we go. I don't know if you can see that small print there, but I'll, I'll go through a couple lines on this. The way the bank account works is um, you have to you have to understand a couple terms, and then uh, it's kind of a complicated sweep account that happens for various reasons. So. Um, I'll talk slowly, and if anyone has any questions about a topic I'm on, please please ask it then, so we can get make sure people are clear. Um, just to do, define what a uh, sweep account is, a sweep account is a bank or brokerage account that automatically transfers amounts that exceed a certain level into a higher interest bearing investment option at the close of each business day. So, what that means is the clearinghouse. The federal clearinghouse would clear all the checks, all the wires, all the ACHs, and then you're left with your cash balance after everything is cleared, and that would sweep to an account uh, that gets interest or swept to account to that does something uh, specifically that that the company organization wants. Uh, commonly, the excess cash is swept into a bank interest bearing account or a money market fund. Uh, another thing to mention is if you look at the notes section, which is on the far right, there's some references to uh, what's called peg accounts. You'll see on the first line, end, there's 750,000. The line going down, there's 250. What that means is these accounts were set up to hold that amount of money in those accounts uh, to cover anything that's that's clearing or, or wasn't uh for some reason it was missed and it, you want to have money in there in case the sweep takes everything out. So. Uh, what we've done uh, yesterday after uh, discussions on Tuesday with the Finance Committee is we've analyzed these accounts and, and we've lowered the peg amounts. There's four accounts that have peg amounts associated with them, which totaled $2 million. So uh, in talking with our, our banker and with our folks here on how much we really need to have in these accounts, we've reduced that by $1.4 million. So we're only going to have 650000 in a peg amount on these various accounts. And then we'll continue to monitor that. If we can make those lower, we will. And what that means is we'll have more cash to go to the sweep accounts to get interest. Um, in, in discussions with uh, with Dwight and other members uh, of committees and things, and the finance committee, it, it appears that we weren't getting enough interest income. So I did a deep dive uh, with all of our accounts, thus this matrix. We had three checking accounts that Unbeknownst to me, uh, they weren't gaining interest overnight. So uh, as soon as we found out that we do some manual uh, uh, transfers of funds to make sure these funds go to an interest bearing account. And we will, uh, we're working with several people. We're going to have some follow up discussions with uh, Harry Singh, Dan Ring, and Mary Hurt to further go through our accounts and analyze what's the best way to do sweep accounts. Um, also on this chart, if you look in the middle far right, you have something called Mechanics 1, Mechanics 2, Mechanics 3. This represents three different investments on longer term uh, high interest rates. So we'll be analyzing and, and making recommendations to the Finance Committee as to how much more of our excess cash do we want to put in longer term uh, commitments and, and, and make a, a longer return. Uh, so just to kind of explain how these sweeps work, I'll go through one example or two examples, probably the first two lines there. So the first line is we have a bank account for mechanics banks for GRF. It's a checking account, accounts payable. The bank account number is star 5820. And so what this means is this was sweeping into a, a bank account in the next column that didn't have, have interest uh, associated with it. So um, what that sweep did is it, it did it did uh, fund or it did apply to FDIC insurance to make sure that these uh, these monies were insured overnight. Uh, what we need to move them to another account. And so we've doing our manually uh, transferring excess funds to the next one over to star six zero zero five. So we're taking an, a, an active daily approach to put these funds into interest bearing accounts as opposed to just sitting in an account not bearing any interest. And these are pretty large dollar amounts. They could range anywhere from two to $6 million daily. Um, the next account is an example. Uh, it's star 0684. And this one sweeps into account 
that actually does earn interest. So this whole this whole graph, and it's it's kind of confusing and hard to explain uh, with the small print, but each line item is how all these accounts work and how, where all this money goes. So I think this is a good starting point for us to really critically look at how we invest funds in 2024 and make sure that we get the highest returns uh, available to us. And with that, um, and there's also different footnotes. If you look under that, uh, if you go to the far right notes and you go back left, there's footnotes. There's various footnotes in there that give you some more explanations. But I'll open up for questions now. Hey, Tom, uh, thank you for updating your spreadsheet. Just a note, the spreadsheet that's in the agenda packet does not match what we're seeing on the screen. So maybe you could uh, provide that to Deborah so that we could update what's in the agenda packet. I would also I, point I out- I certainly will. Thank you. I would also point out you've got full account numbers listed. Um, I would not do that. Uh, if you could change that before that gets republished. I will do that. Thank you. Any questions for Tom? Obviously, this is an important area that we maximize uh, earnings on our cash balances, and we're happy that that is uh, under review. Any other questions? I don't see any. Tom, thank you very much. If anyone has any follow-up questions, feel free to call me or email me, or if you have suggestions, more than happy to receive those as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Next up is uh, another resident advisory committee, Burke Ferrari for golf. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, two things. First, uh, the membership. We had a very nice increase last month. Uh, the membership now stands at 765 for the four golf clubs. That's almost exactly where it was uh, in 2023 at this time. So all things being equal, we should end up 2024 where we were last year. Uh, secondly, uh, attendees at the annual Golf Mexico trip uh, returned on Tuesday night. It was a, an excellent trip. The weather was perfect. The hotel, I think, is the, probably the best that I've at, uh, attended. And um, interesting, we had 178 people signed up for the trip. 66 of those uh, were non-golfers. <laughs> so... I think, I remember last month somebody said, well, could we go on this trip or something? And uh, the answer is yes. And 66 people took advantage of a very, uh, very nice, all expense paid week in Mexico. That's a lot of beer cart drivers. You, you, that, I, I guess you need designated drivers on the golf course. That's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there certainly were uh, these golf courses. They had uh, uh, drink trucks going around with uh, <laughs> as much hard liquor as you would want. I mean, it was <laughs> so. Anyway, so I, it just goes to show that the uh, this is a very attractive trip, and people are beginning to realize. You know, I can go. I don't have to play golf. So, yeah. all right. Any, Any questions, questions for Bert? Nice tan, by the way. Uh, so, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, off play as well as revenue, very strong for January. Yes, uh, indeed. Which uh, all residents appreciate because that uh, helps to offset the coupon. Yes. Uh, but uh, the disturbing from the ground maintenance that we are, have such a problem still with supply chain issues on getting you know, the proper maintenance equipment in. Uh, some things ordered two years ago, according to the report. Uh, this is apparently true, and one of the one of those items would be the um, the ball dispenser on the driving range, which has been on order for quite a while. But I understand from Mark that uh, that's being installed in the month of March, or maybe within a week. So it takes time, but these things eventually happen. Terrific. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank it you. So I think it might be good to make a slight change in the agenda here. And Ann Matola, I'm going to look to you because I saw David in the crowd and I apologize that we didn't move that up earlier, but I think now would be an appropriate time. 
So we're going to move to agenda item, what is that? Under new business, uh, 12A. It looks like it's on. It is. Okay. Um, good morning. So we're very pleased to have with us today Dave Massenton and Donna Bazzi from ELS Architecture. And they're going to present an, ups, an update on the space study of the medical center. Um, as you recall, ELS began working on this study back in September when you authorized the contract to move this project forward. And so as you look at this, just to be reminded, because um, we did review the SIP planning, this isn't a final plan. It's just a way to take a look at the services we want to relocate, see what could fit there. Um, the process that got there, they'll kind of talk about that in detail about meeting with the different departments. And I'll say there's been some communication since the planning committee and, and um, staff seeing that. And so it looks like we'll be able to fit nearly all the services there, but there'll be some adjustments from what you see should this project move forward. So with that, I'll turn it over to David and Donna. Thank you, Anne, and thank you to the board for giving us some time uh, to discuss this. So as you know, we've been working the past few months to see how we could turn the 1220 Rossmore Parkway building into a Rossmore City Hall that would move all of the MOD, or most of the MOD functions, as well as other functions that are administrative, uh, into one place so that all residents have a common area to go to. Um, the way that we've looked at this really uh, has been from the, from the view of the user. We interviewed all the different user groups to find out how many offices and how many cubicles and how much management and uh, community space that they needed. And then we went back and we, we did space plans that you'll show you to, we'll show you today on how all of that fits into the building. Um, before we get into that, a couple of comments about the building. It is an older building. Uh, it does have some uh, needed repairs that would include probably new windows, a new roof, uh, new HVAC equipment, and uh, the GRF is currently in the process of having the slab tested um, because half of it is underpinned and half of it is not. Um, Walnut Creek is famously on many, uh, many acres of expansive soil, so the, uh, without the underpinning, the slab may be showing some movement. Um, all that said, the building is a wood frame building uh, built in the 70s. Uh, it's a sheer wall wood frame building, which means that there are long interior walls that contribute to the structure uh, in, in the event of an earthquake. Uh, we have tried to preserve those as much as we can to reduce the overall future cost of the work. Uh, we did do a study to see if we just cleared all those out, what would that mean? And it didn't really result in anything, frankly, that was any better than where we were uh, maintaining those shear walls as much as we could. As you know, the building has three floors. Uh, it has a very small upper floor or mezzanine floor, and then it has a fairly large basement with a room that opens out onto a patio. Uh, we have not in this study included an elevator. Again, you know, just consider it of costs, um, but an elevator improvement would probably cost you about a half a million dollars and it would allow you to free up that additional space for future use and expansion. I think the most telling part of this process is that we, we were able to fit everything into the building, but we did not have any additional space. Um, there was originally interest uh, from Ross Moore and the GRF to have some leasable space in this building. Uh, I think that's still potential. Uh, if we decide not to move all of these different groups over to this building, um, we have some thoughts about you know what might be easiest in that respect. Um, but at this point, if we fit everyone in that we wanted to, it does take up the full floor plate uh, without an elevator. So I want to hand it over to Donna, who's done most of the space planning, and she'll walk you through what you see on the screen uh, in terms of how everything is laid out. Donna? Good morning, everyone. Um, so, as David mentioned, we talked to all of the different departments and we kind of understood what they needed, the number of offices, but also what adjacencies they needed, who needed to be close to other departments for the way, based on the way that they function. Um, and one of the main things is also understanding which of these departments have a lot of residents coming in and out and placing those people closer to the lobby so that they had easy access without needing to go throughout the entire building. Um, and that's why we've placed um, the mutuals, alterations and resales, and member records close to the lobby in the current pharmacy space um, for, again, easy access for residents. Um, the boardroom one that you see at the northeast, that would be for mutuals. 
um, for because of the large number of meetings that they would have, and again, a lot of people coming in and out in close proximity to the reception desk. Um, public service, public safety, uh, we would be able to move the public services desk, which would be like RFID tags, and um, which is currently, I forget what building it's in, but we would be able to move that those desk services um, to the new building, and again, with that idea of like a city hall for residents to be able to come in and out easily. Um, Meeting space, one of them is located centrally. Um, for a lot of the people that we interviewed wanted something that was close to the reception to be able to not meet with residents necessarily in their offices, but have a larger space to meet with them um, outside of offices. Um, for the rest of it, I'll kind of just go over the big picture. Um, boardroom two seems like, it seemed like a good space that to, to put one of the two larger boardrooms with the, with the view. Um, admin spaces, uh, those are located centrally because they seem to need um, communication with many of the different departments. Um, for finance, accounting, we, as David mentioned, we, we do have these shear walls that we're working with, um, but we are able to create openings to, to have a bit more fluidity and have some light coming in from the courtyards to the central part of the offices. Um, so we have a large number of cubicles to, to accommodate and those would kind of spill out and be able to have, uh, I wish I could point, but um, be able to have uh, courtyard access and to have that light filter through. Um, HR needed a space which was more of a private suite and so they're, they're located on the east side with their own training room and resident services um, had asked for some cubicles that were a little more separated from others, so they're, they're on that northeast side of the building. Um, moving to the west side, um, work order specialists, um, building maintenance, landscape, all of these departments had asked for some, some kind of an adjacency or proximity to one another. Um, and then IT on the west side, News takes up quite a bit of space and their location was determined by the, um, the news warehouse. They wanted a warehouse that was three times the size of their current one um, and there is access through double doors to a large space on that uh, west side where we've placed it. Um, I think that's kind of the big picture. Um, if you had any questions. About anything specific. So let me just reiterate. So this is just a study to see how this building could be used. There is no commitment at this point in time, and then we really appreciate all of the work that you guys have done to get us this far. Uh, but um, there was a question, I think, at planning about parking. Would there be adequate parking for employees and residents? Yeah, we did look at that, and we, we would have adequate parking for employees, and I think based on what we looked at, there would be about 25 left over. That's if everyone in the building who works there was parked, you would still have about 25 visitor parking spaces. And yet, Ted? Just uh, one more thing on the parking. Uh, you mentioned one of the meeting, possibility of one of the meetings being from mutuals up at the top up there uh, near the entrance. Uh, at 20 extra, 25 extra parking places, how would, is, is that enough to be able to handle the mutual plus the people who would show up at the mutual? You know, I'm thinking, have we looked at that piece of it when we're saying that we're going to allow, you know, a meeting for, like, say, a mutual there, how many people might show up for it with only 20, 25 spots? Okay. <clears throat> I mean, I think that's a really good question. Um, the, the way that we're seeing the parking is that if it's fully occupied, there's maybe 93 to 95 people. You have 115 spaces uh, available, but it's unlikely that everyone will actually be in the lot. So I think, you know, we need to understand how many cars you expect to see kind of on your largest size. But I think what you're, what you're asking is a really good question because I think the reality is some of the larger mutuals do have quite a few people and they're not going to carpool. And I think, you know, is this where those larger mutuals are going to hold their meetings, or does it happen fireside or another larger space on the campus? Yeah. 
I just want to make a comment on that because Vermeuse is all the buzz. Um, so when we were doing this um, exercise, what we wanted to do to see if we could add additional meeting space. So again, as we're organizing and figure out where different types of uses will have meeting space, we would throw this into the mix. But it's not as if every meeting that's a mutual meeting we're trying to fit there. Sometimes they'll have like smaller groups that need spaces. And so we would be mindful of the type of group and the occupancy that we put in there. So we put it as a placeholder right now because the idea is if we could set up a few meeting spaces similar to the current boardroom where it has all of the um, media intact, it's a really good setup for those types of meetings, we could, uh, we could kind of flip uses on it too. But the idea is it's that type of a space for kind of a smaller board type meeting. Mary? I have a question. Uh, since initially we were thinking there would be space available to rent, okay, can you tell us after meeting with the departments whether the space they're requesting if the, in this building exceeds what they currently have and by how much? That's a really good question. Generally, uh, when we talked to various departments, um, some of them were a little small and some of them were, were too large. I mean, it kind of depended on department by department. I think, you know, if we were to give everyone the space that they currently have now, there might be a little bit left over, but it's not a dramatic difference. Any other questions? Cameron? Two, really. Um, one, um, I look at all the people that are going to be there, and I look at the restroom space, and it seems, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's a consideration. I don't know how many you know, when I, when I see the two larger restrooms, I don't know how many stalls there are in there or anything like that, but it seems like it's not a lot for 95 people and guests. Um, and what do you think? Currently what's in here would, I, I forget the exact number of stalls, I would have to look back at the plumbing count, but currently what's shown is what would be required by code um, based on the occupancy and the number of people. Um, could it be increased to have a little more flexibility? And it, it potentially could, but what we, what we show currently is what would be required per code for the amount of people. There's always porta potties too, Carol, but, <laughs> but go ahead. Go ahead. Um, um, my second question, um, in terms of the news, I see the news has a lot of space. So it looks like the news would move out of its present location, but the TV studio would stay where it is. Would TV then take over what news has now? Or you didn't even look at that? Uh, I think that's one of the things that Anne has been talking about is what they do with the leftover space. If, if news were actually to move here, um, what would, where, who would use that leftover space? But yes, currently TV was gonna stay where they were because of, um, was it the fiber optics or the connectivity or I forget the technical Yeah, term. T TV has so much equipment that it's just not realistic to move them. Um, you know, what would happen to the news space would have to be studied uh, later. You know, news, news likes where they are. So, I mean, I think one potential is if news stays and that space uh, that we're dedicating here in the lavender would become potential leasable space. Maxine? Am I missing a lunchroom? Yeah, there's a lunchroom. Did, I just didn't see it? Currently, it's, it's on the smaller side. It's the kitchenette, which would be just the space where people are reheating their food. And then there's a smaller break room, which is um, on the Oh, I see it. Side. I'm sorry. I just missed it. Um, there was, we talked about in the last meeting, potentially being able to use the room that's below the boardroom currently. Uh, which is, would be a decent size employee space, but we would have to figure out accessibility and whether we can, if we don't add an elevator to the building, whether or not we can have accessibility through the exterior path. And I also realize this is just a first draft of exactly. Just, it's kind of just to generate all these questions. Yeah. And there's beautiful outside outside space with picnic tables as right. well. Cheryl. Yeah, a couple of questions. Um, one is I. It would help me to recognize what other space is being freed up to find out what exactly is freed up in Gateway, the news up there on the MOD site. 
I would also note that the MOD site doesn't probably lend itself to other uses. So that's something to take into consideration. And I'm concerned about the notion that we might move all a lot more of the meetings that we have here down to that site. The parking, I think, is a big concern. So that's. Any other questions? So Cheryl, you, you touch on a very important topic, and that is that when we're updating the facility master's plan over the next couple of months is taking a look at, first of all, is this project even feasible? And secondly, if it is, what does it do to the other properties that become available? And what additional uh, services or resident uh, abilities do we have by doing that? So it's a, it's a bigger picture long term of what that means. So uh, that's really important. And it's not going to be answered in one month. <laughs> We're going to have a number of meetings to get there. And then that impacts the funding requirements and looking at what other facilities uh, uh, need updating, you know. Go to the dollar house when you go, hey. <laughs> go to the hillside pool uh, locker rooms or the hillside facility. So we have a lot of infrastructure issues that are long-term decisions, and this is a part of fact-finding to make, those, uh, make intelligent decisions uh, going forward. Uh, any other questions at this point? Thank you, guys. Really thank appreciate you. it, and sorry to keep you so long. No, no worries. Thanks right. so much for your time. All right, thank you. Uh, this is probably a good time for a five-minute break. It is 10.26, so let's get back at 10.31. Okay, it is 10.31. We'll um, start to reconvene. I think Cheryl will be coming back, as far as I know. Uh, so leading off, we'll talk about the uh, Compensation Committee. James Lee, Chair. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, during a February meeting, uh, I'll just be a quick report. During a February meeting, uh, you. <laughs> we, we first set our meeting calendar for the year, and we also set a committee goal to look at trends in wages and benefits so that later in the year, we will be able to project a proposed wages and benefits package for all of our going rate employees in two, for uh, 2025. Uh, the next item we looked at was that we kind of took a quick look, uh, a look back at the makeup of our going rate employees in 2023, uh, give us a better idea, a better understanding of our employee demographics and uh, how well our employees are doing their jobs. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite Eric up. Um, he can, he's our senior manager of human resources, and he can give us a much more in-depth look at our groups of employees. Eric? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to be here. Um, so every February, we have a section of our meeting called Look Back, Look Back Reports. And it's not just a look back in time of how we did in the previous year. It actually is, provides us some good information uh, to discuss as our committee some indicators of things that could be on the horizon for us, which are really important and to, to remind everybody um, and to uh, the resident audience is the purpose of the committee is to take a look at compensation benefits as it relates to employee acquisition or hiring, recruiting, as well as retention. And it's important for those two areas to be stable in order to provide the services that we do here. So the numbers that are produced and just the overall well-being that it being the metrics that we look at for how employees are doing are very important in how we evaluate the overall health of, of staff. So um, I'll talk about, you know, that's not, not really a full report, but just to give you an example of some of the things that we review, the slide that you're looking at now is just an, uh, an overall view or picture of our performance evaluations, which we do at the end of the year based on certain criteria and questions. And for me, you know, looking at it as the HR person, I'm, I'm looking for this relatively bell-shaped curve to see that, you know, are our employees performing within the zone that they are? We would use a five-point scale, one to five. Three does not mean that it's like a grade C. A, a, a three means that individuals are in that range or performing the jobs that they're um, hired to do. So it actually is a pretty healthy picture of what they are. You'll see kind of a, a spike, we're in the area of 4 to 4.24, and 
for the, the tenure that we have of our employees, that's expected. If you've been here for a long time, you should know your job and you should be probably performing it at a more exceptional level than somebody that's been here, let's say maybe a couple years. But again, this is just a picture of the oral health of what we do in terms of performance. I really wanna highlight some of the other reports that we have. This is a little bit small, but we also talk about the reasons for terminations that have happened over the last year and by um, in different angles. I, I, these reports are really like lenses in how to look at the overall health of what we're doing here. This next slide actually I think is a little bit more telling. So I'm, I'm gonna focus really on the top one, uh, and to you know, address I think what, what Jeff mentioned earlier, the concerns that there, you know, there's so many employees leaving, there's a lot of turnover. I think it has to be put in perspective that you know, one is that if you compare the turnover in 2023 over 2022, we reduce from 45 down to 31. So we also reduce that turnover from 22.9 down to 14.9%. Uh, so that's a pretty good gain there. The year prior was kind of the aftermath of both COVID and kind of the changes within our society on politics and social things that kind of, for individuals who are thinking about retirement, you know, that was really kind of the time. So you said kind of a, a hiccup there. The 14.9%, you know, may look, still look high. On, on average, a good healthy turnover for an organization is probably about 10 or 11%. That's kind of an ideal. You know, ours is a little bit higher, but when you look at it in context of some of these other numbers, for example, this sheet here talks about our uh, age demographics of our employees. You'll see that 17% of our employees are in that 62 plus age group, so they're already there. They're already eligible for retirement. But then when you add in the next groups, the 59 to 61 and 55 to 58, that adds an additional 30%, making the number of employees about 40, close to 50% of our staff is in that age group where like within the next one to five years, there's a potential that they may retire. So what does that mean? They're numbers, but it's an indication for us to consider is that that would be a large loss to GRF if you had that such a large number of individuals retiring. The great thing is, is that we provide a good culture and I think that employees come here like being here. You know, we've established a, a, a good place for them to be. And the reality is as though that we all age and at some point they are gonna leave. What does that mean? Is at some point is that we have to consider is our employee mix or our benefits or the things that we're doing to retain employees, is, is that what's needed? Plus you kind of compare what we're doing here to some of the things going on externally is that that tenure is going way down. When we look at resumes that come into GRF now, it's, you know, more like if you have three or four years at any one place, that's really good. And so you're seeing with the younger generations coming up, the number of years that they're committed to organizations is also um, going down. For us, um, just note here on this slide, the percentage of staff in our tenure is that we have very good tenure. Our average right now is uh, 9.6 years, which is really good. For non-union staff, that's 9.1 years. For union staff, that's 10.4 years. So again, different lenses for us to consider. But that tenure for GRF, that number will probably go down when you consider 47% of our staff is in that retirement group. So the face of staff will be changing within the next one to five years. And it's important for us as a committee with numbers like this is to consider what do we need to do to help um, retain our employees, whether it's through benefit programs, other things to attract and keep employees here. So this is just an example of things that we look at through our reports. Um, any questions at all? Well, if, if I could just say that, you know, we focus a lot on buildings and infrastructure and funding, but the most important asset that we have is our employees. And these, these sort of look back reports are really important. It's a great reflection on you as a manager and all of the senior managers uh, to see these reports and the positive messages that we see there. So Eric, we appreciate all your efforts in the human resources area to take good care of our most important asset, our employees. Any other questions or comments? Ted. Um, so it looks like we have a good percentage of people, uh, but 55 that could possibly retire from from the organization or will be soon. Um, along with that, my concern is is that the knowledge that they have of Rossmore, uh, 
You know, there's, there's uh, uh, things that happen here. I'm amazed at when you make a phone call, they know where to go, they know where to look, they dig up the ground, there's the broken pipe, or what, they, know what, they know what they're expecting underneath there, they have the parts, they can fix it. That is knowledge that's gonna be really hard to replace. And are we doing, you know, basically, what are we doing something to help pass that knowledge on before it's gone? Yeah, you bring up a very good and serious point, is that because of the number of employees that we're expecting to leave in an institution of knowledge, it's not just about, okay, somebody leaves, you, you put out an ad, you look at resumes, and you plug somebody in. So our, you know, our philosophy is we hire individuals in that have the capabilities to be able to fulfill the role that they have. It sounds great on the surface, but there's a transition time. There's a buildup whenever you have anybody come in, even though they might have other similar industry experience, GRF is unique. They have to learn our culture, they have to learn our policies, our rules, how, how do we do things here? So, you know, and if we staff according to what our service needs are, as if we are fully staffed, that takes time away from other employees to be able to help with that training and process. And so there are a lot of things that you, you, you brought up that's a concern to us is that, how do we staff appropriately, but how do we also train employees to be able to take over once others leave? And how do we keep employees here as long as possible and provide a transition so they're, they're passing this knowledge on? There's not one easy answer to that. But see, these are some of the things that we have to consider. I'd say one of the committee's uh, focus areas will probably need to be starting this year is what other alternative programs we've done. At our last meeting, I introduced what we did in terms of uh, changing our benefits mix to kind of make it a little bit more uh, competitive, given some other benefits and opportunities for employees to save, like with HSA accounts and things. But beyond your core traditional group health programs and things, when we talk about benefits for the workforce these days, it can take on other things, vacation, other perks. You know, you hear about the ghouls that got offered lunches and things like that. And there are certain things that we can't do as an organization, but there are cost-effective things that I think we start, need to start taking a look at if we're serious about turnover and what the implications are, but also keeping our employees. Okay, great. Any other questions? Leanne? <clears throat> Talking about turnover, do you think most departments in Rossmore have a, make a conscious effort to do some cross-training for those times when employees do leave and then you know, somebody knows something about that position that's been vacated? Do you see that? Uh, it, that's again one of those ideals. It's like, well, let's cross train. But again, we do have not as many vacancies as, as Jeff you know, reported now versus like a year ago, but we run, uh, I, I hate to use the word lean, but it takes time away from others to be able to do those things. It has to be a very organized effort to be able to have some sort of a training program. And it, it is hard to find that time to be able to do that. It's like on one hand is that you have to do this in order for continuity, but it's another challenge is to be able to have that time to be able to put together a program to get individuals fully trained. So that's a, that's a work in progress. Anything else? James, anything else from the committee? All right, thank you, James. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Next up is planning. Leanne? Yeah. <clears throat> At our last meeting, we um, had the presentation that you just saw from ELS. Very interesting. We were encouraged by what we saw. And like Dwight said, it's just a first step in analyzing um, our next moves. And um, it's just interesting to know that we possibly could get all those departments up there. Um, and then we also met with Synergy. Synergy is the contractor we've hired to do the food and beverage analysis within Rossmore. Um, we were very encouraged by the way they laid out their methodology. Um, they're going to be with us for six months. And <clears throat> I know everyone in Rossmore is very interested in that topic. Everybody loves food and beverage. And I encourage residents to attend the planning committee meetings for the next six months to see what's happening with that study, um, what are the milestones, what have they discovered, as well as to have a voice. So um, I encourage you to attend planning committee meetings on the second Thursday of every month. Uh, they're held at 10.30 in the board meeting, and that's about it. 
Any questions for Leanne? Uh, okay. What is the timeline on the food and beverage study and results? Do we? Um, we believe it's going to be six months, so fall. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, next up is policy. Maxine Topper. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, committee continues continue the discussions on revisions to policy 103.5 demonstrations on GRF property, which as Jeff highlighted is a very sensitive um, and relevant <laughs> issue that's not only affecting Rossmore but the entire community as Cindy talked about earlier. It's a very sensitive topic important to many Rossmore residents and that also is indicated by the amount of communication that we've received from residents about this issue and presence in meetings. And personally, I'm really um, warmed. I don't know if that's the right word, but, but I'm so happy to see so many people engaged with the topic, even though it's a very difficult one. And we do appreciate comments and encourage anybody with thoughts on the subject, whether or not they come to the meeting or communicate to us or can send emails to grb at rossmore.com so we can consider all of that as we move forward. And the, the notes from the last meeting are published in the agenda. So if you want to have a little more detail about what was discussed at the meeting, you can look there. Committee will also, um, we will continue to review this issue at the next policy meeting, which is on March 11th at 1.30, I believe, as revisions continue to be made before submission to the board. Um, we are looking at, uh, our intention is to continue to develop a policy for the benefit and safety of all Rossmore residents. Okay, additional discussions were held regarding the renaming of Rossmore Trails for ease of use and simplification, and we thank Tom for all her, um, not Tom, John. John. Too many Johns, Toms, they all, yeah. Um, and Anne's there, we have to get some people with, maybe Eric could hire some people with different names, so it makes this a little easier. Um, during, regarding the renaming of the Rossmore Trails for the ease and use of simplif and simplification. Um, we also continue the discussion about clarification of wording for plaques on items donated by residents in honor of or in memory of others that have contributed so much to Rossmore. Additional notes are included in the agenda packet, and I hope many of you will join us at our next meeting. Okay, any questions for Maxine? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to uh, some good work from the policy committee in regards to a second reading of the procedures on elections. Uh, Deborah, is there anything you need to add to that or? No, this is the second reading before the board. So if there are no further revisions or concerns sent back to policy, you will be making a motion today to approve as revised. Okay. Are there any comments or questions? Carol, I see uh, you reaching. It's not a comment, but I'd like to make the motion. Okay, all right. <laughs> I move that the board approve the revised procedure 103 elections as recommended by the policy committee. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Mary Hurt has seconded. Any further discussion? Leanne? I just wondered, uh, the policy puts specific dates in, there are specific dates in the policy. Should those dates be worded to apply to every year instead? For instance, second Thursday of a month, second Wednesday of, Wednesday of March, whatever. Should it be more generic? So I don't know what exactly you're referring to, but all of this really ties into our bylaws, which does specifically call out number of days. And the second Wednesday of the month, a news article is required. The uh, I think the second Monday in May is a requirement. So these are all really tied to the bylaws, but if you can point to... Right, but what's in the packet, it says like a date in 2024, doesn't it? I don't know where you're referring to. In the summary report or in the policy itself? Oh, let's see.
So page 11, a seven and eight says a typical schedule. What page? Um, 11, a eight. Yes, that is an example. It says a typical schedule for a year in which the second and blah, blah, blah. It's just an example of formality as it's tied to the bylaws. It's not um, calling out specific dates. Go up to the previous page. Yeah. If you look at the previous okay. page. Um, I missed that line. All right, thank you. Sure. Okay, any other questions? If not, uh, roll call, Deborah. Certainly, Walker. Yes. Hamaji. Yes. Topper. Yes. Hurt. Yes. Bentley. Yes. Hines. Yes. Lee. Yes. Blair. Yes. And Meehan. Yes. It's unanimous. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I guess uh, Deborah, we're uh, Pitney Bowes inflation has hit us. It's hitting everywhere. Yes, so our accounting department is on top of everything and they confer with the auditing firm who would really appreciate if we add in the uh, California taxes that were included um, <laughs> in this invoice, but not during the meeting. So the um, totals were outlined in color format as outlined in the agenda showing the trust budget items and then the other colors were coded for operating funds so the total um, i'm asking for the board to resend its prior motion made on december 7th to uh, approve the mail machine for 13,500, and instead now authorize for uh, the purchase of that machine to the trust estate fund for an amount of sixteen thousand. $153.43. So this is not for the gold-gilded model. This is still no, the standard model with sales taxes included. It's $1,000 for a California taxes. So yeah, yeah. Was, okay. Well. All right. Any questions about the mailing machine? Mary? I move that the board rescind the motion adopted on 12-7-2023 to authorize general manager to sign a contract with Pitney Bowes for the purchase of a new mail machine from the trust estate fund for an amount of 13,500 and replace it with the following, authorize the general manager to sign a contract with Pitney Bowes for the purchase of a new mail machine from the trust estate fund for an amount of $16,153.43. That was good, Mary. Is there a second? <laughs> Carol. Second. Carol Lair seconded that. Uh, any further discussion? Roll call, Deborah? Certainly. Walker? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Topper? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Hines? Yes. Lee? Yes. Lair? Yes. And Meehan? Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you, and thank you, Deborah. Uh, next, we're going to talk about uh, water valves. Here at Gateway, Ann Matola. Speaking of porta potties, we went through that for a time period there. Yes, we did, but we're good for another 30 years, I think. Um, so, this item is approval of an emergency repair to two water main valves at Gateway um, that occurred in October. That's when the first, that's when the disruption occurred, and we had to do the repair in two phases due to supply chain. So, we had a temporary fix in October and then fixed everything permanently in December. And so Martin Lemons is here. If you really wanted to know the technical in and outs of what exactly happened, he can speak to that infrastructure much better than I. But essentially, the repairs were complete. Adrian spoke to the item going before the Finance Committee. And um, Tom was kind enough to uh, confirm for today that it is an operating expense. And so we're looking for approval of that expense. OK. Any questions? By the way, and, and Martine, we love having you here, but uh, it, it was initially thought to cost a lot more, as I recall, maybe fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. So I was glad to see, maybe I had a bad recall on that. So at any rate, uh, uh, any further discussion? Leanne? I'd like to make a motion. Okay. I move that we approve the emergency expense of um, not to exceed $35,000 from operation, operating account to replace the two water main valves at Gateway. Second. Is there, okay. I want a second. Maxine, seconded. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
like. Any further discussion? All right, roll call, Deborah. Certainly, Walker. Yes. Hamaji. Yes. Topper. Yes. Hurt. Yes. Bentley. Yes. Hines. Yes. Lee. Yes. Blair. Yes. And Meehan. Yes. It's unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Anne. Uh, next up is uh, Deborah. We need we need some election oversight because this is not going to be a rigged election. This will be. <laughs> Certainly. So I'm asking the board to consider a new company called the Inspectors of Election. The previous year we had used a Bellwether, which provided a uh, lovely service. However, this particular company was brought to my attention that had a dual option of in paper and electronic, so online option for a little bit less than what Beth Bellwether had offered. So it's a bonus. I think you get more for the buck per se, and it, we have references attached of the other organizations and communities who've used their services. And um, just a really good comprehensive background on who they are and their services. Um, it's kind of a mom and pop shop of sorts, and I highly recommend them. So that's my recommendation. Any questions? James? Uh, looking on page 12C3, it says Golden Rain Foundation District A full hybrid election service. This is not just paying for District A's election, right? We're paying for all the districts? Or, or am I this misreading is, the header? Yes. So this is a sample. Oh, okay. Um, so this is preemptive. So we haven't actually gone to ballot with any specific district um, yet. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking possibly A, since that, that has multiple candidates interested. But this is just a preemptive approval by the board. Um, this is, you know, just a, yeah, a draft. This, in this is for the total cost of the election for all the districts if needed. So this, yeah, per district. Per Correct. district? Per district. Ah, so this So we cost have, yeah, we have budgeted $5,000 per district for okay. our uh, okay. Okay. budget. I but I think this is um, $2,229. Okay, okay, yeah. That, that's what I was wondering. It wasn't the total cost of everything, just per district. Okay, I got it. I'm okay. Okay, all right. Carol? I'd like to make a motion. Oh, okay. I move that we grant approval for the appointment of the inspectors of election, an election inspection company, to oversee the printing, mailing, and counting of ballots for the anticipated election of GRF directors, and that we authorize the general manager to execute a letter of understanding that delineates the scope of the services to be rendered. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Mary Hurt is always eager. <laughs> Any further discussion? I did do one. Roll call, Deborah. Certainly, Walker. Yes. Hamaji. Yes. Topper. Yes. Hurt. Yes. Bentley. Yes. Hines. Yes. Lee. Yes. Lair. Yes. Ed Meehan. Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you. So the next item, you know, is one that I, I take a lot of pleasure in. I'm always heartened by residents stepping forward to volunteer and contribute to the welfare of our community. Uh, so the Aquatics and Fitness Committee, uh, Harriet Crosby, uh, resigned, and we thank her for her efforts and, and her assistance with that committee. But uh, at this meeting, we're appointing Mike Charter as the new chair, effective immediately, with a term running through June of 2025. So we thank Mike for stepping forward, as well as all the volunteers on, on all of the resident advisory committees. So uh, I don't believe that that requires any motion. Um, I get to be a dictator for one item. Uh, announcements, uh, there will not be a mid-month regular meeting of the board in March. The end of the month regular meeting of the board will be held Thursday, March 28th at 9 a.m. in this room. And at this point in time, we are going to recess into executive session. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>